Hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of the Toker Titan Cast. I am your host, Davis Middle, also known as Titan Goji, content creator on YouTube. And it has been so long, hasn't it? Uh, I'd say it's probably been about a year since the last time we did uh, another edition of this little show. But as a way to, I suppose you could say, come back from hiatus, um, what other way to do it than have it be in the form of an interview. And ladies and gentlemen, it brings me great pleasure to present to you, Eric Kelso. How are you doing, Eric? Good, how are you doing? I'm doing fantastic. It's it's awesome to be here. It's a huge honor getting to uh, speak with you on this occasion. Oh, thanks for having me. And congratulations on uh, getting back in the swing of things after a long delay and long you know hiatus there. I think a lot of people <clears throat> did take a break from life for quite oh, a while. Yeah. Those who uh, don't know, Eric Kelso is a Japan-based uh, voice performer who has appeared in numerous TV programs, commercials, radio, as well as educational materials, uh, especially for networks such as NHK, BBC, and CNN News. He also has some experience as a writer, producer, and director. You may recognize him for his roles in video games like Jackie Bryan in Virtua Fighter, Paul Phoenix in Tekken, Guizhang Chen in Shenmue or Shenmue, however you wish to pronounce it. Actually, I was three people. I was uh, Ren, Fukusan, and Guizan. Captain Falcon in F-Zero GX, and the voice of not only Ultraman Zero, but also Ultra Dark Killer in the Ultra series. Ultra Dark Killer. Ultra Galaxy Fight the Destined Crossroad just uh, wrapped up, so. Yeah, that just released, that's out now. On, uh, on, if you're on YouTube, you can watch that episode. Oh too. yeah. Nothing quite so interesting. It was just kind of an accident. I had never wanted to be a voice actor. It never crossed my mind. <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> I studied film in university at the uh, University of California at Santa Barbara. And after I graduated, I wanted to make documentaries about different cultures around the world and just travel and be like an Indiana Jones kind of documentary filmmaker. Nice. <laughs> but I'd never really been out of California. So I thought, well, I, you know, I got to learn something before I can talk about it. <clears throat> so I, I sold everything I had and with a few bucks left over. I uh, went to start my 10 year sojourn around the world to uh, just have an adventure and find interesting things. And I was interested in Japan at the time. I, I loved the food. I had some Japanese friends. I loved the films and, and it was just very exotic for me. This is 1986. And so at that time, there weren't many uh, foreigners in Japan. And so it was very exotic. And so I thought, okay, I knew I could teach English there because the yen was strong and there was English teaching jobs. <clears throat> so I jumped on a plane with 300 bucks in my pocket and carry on and no hotel reservation or job or anything. And just uh, started, actually got a job and started working on my first day. And then after being around for about two years, I didn't really save any money. My plan was just to be two years and save money and then go to the next country. But it was the most expensive city in the world at the time. Uh, I was also having a lot of fun, so I wasn't saving as much as I should. And uh, one night I was having a drink at a local bar and another guy came in who I knew, his name was Julian McFarland <clears throat> from Canada. And he was the only other foreigner who went into that bar. So we just sat at the counter together and started talking. And he went out to make a telephone call to his wife, who was also his agent. And he, he was a voice actor, narrator. And uh, he came back in. He said, Eric, can you do me a favor? And I said, sure, what, what, what do you need? And he said, I'm booked Thursday to do this children's English textbook. But I just got a, offered a job at the same time to do a TV commercial, which pays, you know, much, much better. Can you cover the kids thing for me? And I said, I don't know, can I? I mean, what, what, what do I need to do? He said, oh, you've got a decent voice. You're a smart guy, you'll figure it out. So I'm like, okay. <laughs> so I did, <clears throat> and I went, and it was a two hour gig, and it paid a lot better than teaching at the time. And, and I liked it. 
And I thought, wow, people actually do this for a job. You know, there's so many voices you hear on things. You don't realize people are doing that. Oh, yeah. You know, when, when you use your teller machine at the bank and it says, please deposit something, something, that's a person's voice kind of thing. You want to make a telephone call and they say something, you know, please hold the line or something. That's a person doing that. <clears throat> so there are just voices everywhere. And, um, and so I kind of figured out how to do it. You know, I found out you could get agents there. You know, you can make a demo and, uh, the studio, the, the client liked me and the studio liked me. So he gave me that job. It was a monthly gig for two hours a month and it was nice. And I started making friends and, and figuring out how the business worked. <clears throat> and as I started getting more jobs in that, in the voice work, I started kind of cutting down my teaching as the voice picked up and was able to kind of ease into it a bit. And I still do some teaching, um, but just things that I like, you know, before I was teaching like high school and college and things, and I didn't really like it as much. And, um, and so that's how I got into it, you know, just kind of by chance, helping out a buddy at a bar. And then uh, the video game jobs came up and that made it a lot more interesting and exciting. And then I was doing a lot of things with NHK TV. And then another, you know, the time passed and I still hadn't saved up that much money. And so I thought, well, my, my life is kind of cool right now. You know, I got a cool job and, <clears throat> you know, I'm kind of settling in. I, I don't feel like a tourist anymore. You know, I feel like this, this is kind of my home. I had a, I had a Japanese girlfriend and, and I was thinking, uh, well, I could change my life or I could change my plan. And I liked my life at the time. So I thought it was much easier just to change my plan. And so two years plan became 37 years of life. Wow. <laughs> All because you took that one golden opportunity. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, because a buddy just said, can you do me a favor? And I said, okay. And that's how I started voice acting. Yeah, <laughs> it, it, it's it, it's like, it's like, hey, can, can you do me this favor? That's going to change your life for the next yeah. decades. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was really interesting. It's like being discovered in, uh, you know, Schwab's department store, you know, whatever, in Hollywood or something. Yeah. Well, I think everyone has a different quality of voice. And I think the first thing you have to do is understand your strengths and your limits <clears throat> and, uh, and, and try to stand out in some way that you feel comfortable with that kind of is a good voice for you or good, good sound that you can continually do and, and you feel comfortable. <clears throat> um, as far as voice acting, which is different than narration. Narration is just kind of reading something that sounds kind of cool. Right. Um, but voice acting is much different. You know, you're going to do characters and things. Um, <clears throat> but voice acting, um, definitely Mel Blanc, you know, <clears throat> and, oh, yeah. uh, you know, he was with Warner Brothers, Looney Tunes, and he did, you know, he did everyone. <clears throat> and and, and uh, he did, you know, Bugs Bunny and Daffy Duck and Porky Pig, Yosemite Sam, Elmer Fudd. You know, she and he and he did Barney Rubble from the Flintstones and Dino, and I think he did over 400 distinctly different characters in different animations, and uh, he was just called a man of a thousand voices. And and I'm like, how can those different sounds come out of that one guy? And so I was, I would play. You know, especially if I was like in the bath or something, because you have a good echo and, and it's private, you know, nobody's going to be laughing at you and, and just practice doing all kinds of different characters and voices and not trying to copy, you know, I'm like, I can sound like Homer Simpson or something like that. You know, I, I never tried to copy, uh, an already done character, but just tried to think, okay. If I am a little boy, maybe I would sound like this, you know? Or if I'm very old, would I be this kind of old man? Or this kind of old man, you know? <laughs> and then you kind of work your your neck and your body and, and you kind of find out how you can kind of make those sounds. And I think just kind of inspired by Mel Blanc, but just kind of playing, you know, in the bath, helped me find my voices. 
I took a uh, voice acting workshop, you know, just before uh, the pandemic, and they would talk about how it's a lot more than just your voice. It's your neck, uh, your yeah. face, uh, like yeah. whatever hand gestures you want to do. Yeah. Oh, it comes out. Just, yeah, just to really <laughs> get <the> character. <laughs> Even just smiling. Oh, it, yeah. It, your voice completely changes, yeah. In Japan, since English education is a huge industry, um, a lot of the work voice people do in Japan is in education. It's kind of like your bread and butter. It's not the glamour job, but it, it, it pays the bills. And uh, I've done literally thousands of educational recordings um, for you know junior high school, high school, university, English textbooks. <clears throat> um, testing material you know for toic or toefl or step or different things like that a lot of university entrance examinations um and so constantly that that work just constantly comes in um uh, i've done a lot of work for nhk tv which is kind of like the bbc of japan right um, it's the national broadcasting company um and uh I've done TV, radio, <clears throat> um, many shows for them. And they were my sponsor for about 10 years. They sponsored my visa and everything, which was really nice. <clears throat> you know, if you walk into immigration with NHK as your sponsor, nobody blinks, nobody, you know, thinks twice. They'd, oh, yes, you get the stamp right there. Right. <laughs> and uh, so that was really nice. And so that was fun, you know, because I it was fun to do radio as a medium. And then also as TV, you're actually on camera and you're like, hi, today we're gonna study this. And so that was another kind of challenge. I've never really liked being on camera as much as Mike behind the microphone, but it was a good challenge and, and, a, and a good thing. You learn a new skill and uh, it was fun. I really liked it. Yeah, and I, and I still do it, so. I have, a, I have a children's TV show that I do now. It's called Ego de Asabo with Orton. And ego de asobo means playing with English. Ah, okay. it, it, it's like it's like Japanese Sesame Street. Oh, nice. <laughs> and it teaches li teaches little kids English, and it's ego de asobo with Orton, and Orton is this animated whale, and everybody lives on the whale's back in Orton Town, oh, wow. and I'm the voice of the whale. So I'm like, hi, I'm Orton. Today we're going <laughs> to talk about potatoes or something, you know. And and so that's fun, um, and I just I, you know, I I really feel so thankful to that uh, corporation that really gave me a lot of work, and I've done a lot of uh, interesting documentary videos for NHK World that you can watch on your cable TV, or especially if you're in a hotel or <clears throat> just a cable TV channel. It's called NHK World, and it's the NHK documentaries and news, but dubbed in English, which was always interesting because I learned so much about Japanese culture as well when I'm explaining it in English to foreigners you know in other countries and so that's always educational for me as well so uh next question uh, uh Orton what are some facts about potatoes I'm kidding <laughs> <laughs> they're called tubers <laughs> <laughs> I kind of grew up before video games were popular. Um, like when I was in high school is when I saw my first video game at the uh, like round table pizza. Mm -hmm. And it was like Pong and, uh, nice. and Asteroids. I liked Asteroids actually. <laughs> and Space Invaders. Ah, uh, um, yeah, Space Invaders is fun. <laughs> Space Invaders was too high. high Tension for me. I it was like, oh, fucking. They're trying to kill me. I gotta. Yeah, yeah. I don't like that kind of video game. But Asteroids was cool because you got. Oh, I got that. Okay, but I don't think I don't feel like I'm being attacked. Um, so there weren't like role-playing games or really like multi-dimensional games at all when I was a kid. So it was never like part of my makeup, you know, to like grow up with it. And so. 
I kind of was already doing other things when video games really hit their, you know, their stride. So I never had a background personally with video games. Video games are different than just standard narration of documentaries or education or something like that, where you're actually acting. You know, that's oh, yeah. the fun part about voice acting, is your voice acting, you know? Yeah. <laughs> but you don't have to be on stage where people are watching you. You're just in a little studio. <laughs> so you're much freer that way. It, it helped me to kind of dig down and try to find the characters. <laughs> like recently, uh, Shenmue 3 came out last year. And I wasn't asked to do it. <laughs> One reason is I live in Japan. They did everything in the States. And I think they're just trying to kind of reformat it as well with new people. <clears throat> but the, a lot of the fans of the game missed the original voice of the character, uh, of Ren and Guizan and, and Fukusan. <laughs> and so we did a mod. And uh, through Shane Mu Dojo and, and uh, a lot of people, Patty and those people. And uh, everyone did it for free. You know, n nobody got paid a dime, including me and all the programmers and the technicians that we all did just for the love of the game. And so when I was doing those characters, I actually talked about, like I said, oh God, I get to play with my friends again. <laughs> you know, because after a while, you don't feel that you're putting on a character's voice. I think it's important just to feel like that character lives inside you and you're just letting them out to play. Oh yeah. And so when you're reading the line, I'm not, it's not Eric reading the line of Ren. It's Ren just coming out and saying, ha ha, time <laughs> to play, you know, kind of thing. And so that's, I think how you can kind of get closer to the characters is just by letting them out of you and, 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 and understanding that. And I think actors, you know, in film or television or something feel the same way. You, you have to kind of become the character or let them come out of you instead of trying to perform as them. Right. Um, and so doing voice acting in video games really helped me to become a much better voice actor, I think, in that way. I would say video games and animation are the same because it's not an actual person live action speaking. And so you don't have as much attention to the lip flaps. And when it's live action, a lot of times you have to really, um, well, you have to tone it down for, for live action as well, because a lot of times they're real people. Right. You know, and real people don't go, whoa, you know, like, like an animation character will. And yeah. so you kind of have to tone it down, make it a little more realistic. And also you can see their lips moving when they speak. So you have to kind of try to match the lip flaps a bit more carefully. Um, for video games and animation, you, you're, you're freer to uh, go with your own feeling, um, express it more. And, you know, because animation and video games are bigger than real life, you have to be bigger than real life. So you have to kind of go for it. Um, and then the director, it's the director's job to kind of pull you back a little bit. I, I, I try to kind of go over the top as a test and then have the director say, okay, I'll pull that back again. Because you don't really know where you want it until you hit your limit. And right. so, uh, and I, I wouldn't want to come back later and think oh i wish i would have done that a little bit stronger or something you know because i was too hesitant um and so i think that's a difference in that way but as far as <clears throat> animation and video games they're pretty similar in the recording process and and, and how you would go about doing it finding the character Same as every job, you know, your agent, one of your, I, I like, you know, 10, 15 different agents I use. And uh, one of my agents called me and uh, who I'd been working with, you know, for 20 years and kind of knows my range and knows what I do. And so he said, hey, you want to, you want to do an Ultraman? And so I said, yeah, that guy, fuck, I'd love to do Ultraman. Ultraman's great. That's my childhood. 
and uh <clears throat> and so i uh i said yeah sure and so they uh put my my voice audition tape that i had already gave it to the client and they put me into a couple roles um i think the first one i did before ultraman zero somebody else was doing ultraman zero before <clears throat> and i came in and the, for the first series and did ultra dark killer who just always talked like this and he was really fun and then um they 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 didn't really feel the first voice actor matched the character as well um because he had really good kind of cool voice right but i do i have a little bit more higher range so i do a lot of the higher voices and they wanted they wanted ultraman zero to be he's a little younger i guess he's only like 18 or 19 years old or something in the story kind of one, several thousand give or take <laughs> right right but i mean as as, as like as like in human years as we're supposed to think about him yeah <laughs> one of the younger ultramen um but he kind of assumes this leadership position and so they wanted him to be a bit younger kind of like this and uh so a little bit more like a jackie kind of sound and uh so they said okay yeah that's good that's good that's what we want and then and then the past uh, couple of two series i was uh ultraman zero and that's fun. He's he's got he's one of the leading characters, and he does the opening kind of narration of the game and what's happening in this episode and the story. And so he has a little bit bigger part. And uh, so that, you know, the more you speak, the more fun it is. You know, the more range your character has, the more you can kind of get into it. So that's fun. But <clears throat> you had mentioned before, like as as kids, you know, we watched Ultraman. I did. I remember I, I grew up in California, and at the time I was living in Almaden, in the Almaden Mountains of San Jose, before it was Silicon Valley. <coughs> and uh, after school, we'd go to my friend's house, and we'd sit down in front of the TV, and we would watch back to back um, until like our parents came home, uh, Ultraman on Channel 44. Ultraman, uh, Kimba, the White Lion, which was in Japan called Jungle, Jungle Tait Taitan, I think, Jungle Taitse or something like that. And in Japan, Mahogogo, which is Speed Racer. Speed Racer, yeah. And we would watch those. And of course, Godzilla was always good. Oh, uh, yeah. Godzilla kick everybody's butt. He was great. Oh, yeah. And so <laughs> pretty much every day after school, I was just, that was my childhood growing up in elementary school. So to do to do uh, you know anything related to that was just so fun. As a kid, I wasn't into the names of the characters as much. I wasn't kind of a fan as much as just I liked them like running around in their wetsuits, kicking each other's butts. Right. <laughs> you know, and I thought that the costumes of the monsters and things were just so hokey and corny that they were beautiful. You know, oh, there's yeah. something, something that's so beautiful about the absurdity, absurdity of it, and just the, uh, the you know, lack of a budget. <laughs> you know, just making things out of stuff you find laying around, and you know, and the sets, the sets were always great. You know, <clears throat> and one time, I went to the studios where they make the Ultraman and the Godzilla and stuff like that, and uh, saw a lot of the old sets that they used. I was able to walk around through the sets with like the big buildings that they knock down and things. Yeah, and, uh, that, that was really fun. And I guess with that, uh, what's your favorite Godzilla movie? <laughs> oh gosh, I mean the original was just, you know, groundbreaking. Oh yeah. And just the music and uh, and the, the black and white, the very art, you know, the very kind of film noir feeling about it and stuff. I, it's hard to beat the original of almost anything. Oh, yeah. um, but I like the progression of it. You know, it's it's changed. It's, uh, you know, they tried to Americanize it and a lot of people didn't like that. And then recently they brought it back to more of a Japanese look. And uh, <clears throat> I like I like the new resurgent with the Titans. And so, and you know, the, the technology now is so amazing that uh it just it looks 
amazing is too. And that's one of the few movies I will actually go to the theater and watch on like an IMAX screen. Because oh, yeah. the first book, I don't want to watch this, you know, 100 foot tall monster on, on the TV. I want to I want to be there in the front row, you know, kind of thing. Oh yeah, just, yeah, just on, on, the, on the biggest screen uh, imaginable. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so, and I'm a huge uh, you know, King Kong fan and any kaiju kind of thing. I just love giant monsters. Um, my friends actually tease me about it. And so I'm really happy they're making more of those movies now. I like it better than the Marvel Universe. I've never been like superhero fan. We had dinosaurs, oh, you know, yeah. but we never had flying men you know, kind of thing. So, I mean, it seems a bit more realistic as well. And uh, the superheroes, they're always arguing with each other. So they're too human. There's too much of that crap going on. I don't care about like, you know, who your friends are or, you know, if you're lonely or something, you know, just give me big fucking monsters crushing things. You know, that's like my favorite superhero is always been the Hulk, because it's just some, oh, yeah. it's just some nice scientist that when he gets pissed off, he, he you know smashes, and I thought that's that's enough for me. And it's like from the Universal monsters, you know, uh, Frankenstein was always my favorite, because you know I feel sorry for the guy. You know, he didn't have to be put together from different pieces, and then. You know, with a screwed up brain, and then everybody tries to kill him, the poor guy. You know, and so I always kind of have a special place in my heart for, you know, big, dumb, poor things. I studied film in university, so film has always been really important to me. Um, I started university as a psych major. And then I realized there's a lot of reading in that. And I wasn't really sure if I wanted to do all that reading. And then uh, I thought, somebody said they have a film department here. And I was like, Ooh, really? Film? I love movies. So I changed my major to film. <laughs> and I really enjoyed that. So film, since I was a little kid, has always been like my best friend. And so uh, I watch, you know, at least two movies a day um, and uh, so film is probably my greatest love in life and uh, I also love cooking um, I've always loved cooking nice and cooking is like where you know science meets art and I've oh. always had a, a, a kind of a big love for both of those things in my life <clears throat> and so you know, it's about time and heat and amounts and textures and things. You have to combine in the right way. And, you know, it's there's a lot of thought that goes into cooking if, you, if you're a good cook. And uh, I used to teach cooking classes actually with NHK. I taught some cooking classes in Japan. Wow. <laughs> and <clears throat> so I cook every day. I don't really go to restaurants anymore or anything. And my girlfriend, she loves my cooking. So whenever she comes over, she's always you know, I, I give her, I gave her a list of, a, you know, about a hundred different menu items and I say, choose anything on, on there, I'll cook for you. And so she always has her requests and we have a good time. And there's something so Zen about cooking as well that, you know, food is required. You know, it's an essential thing. Looking at a painting or something is not really essential to my life. You know, I can go, oh, that's nice. And I, I can feel something, but you know, a minute later, I'm okay. I, I did it. Yeah. <laughs> um, but food is like essential and every day and how you prepare it or how you eat it or whatever. And it uses all of the senses. It's your eyes. It's your, your nose and your taste and the touch and everything. This is the most amazing thing that you just want to put in your face. <clears throat> and then a cup, you know, a day later, hours later, it is literally shit. Yeah. <laughs> it's, the most, it's the most disgusting thing you would ever want to touch or look at or smell or put in your face. And it's, it's my horrible. body did that. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it went through <clears throat> and my body did that. And so it's just something so beautiful or Zen or balanced or the yin and the yang of that is just so beautiful to me. And that they are both essential for survival. And yet they are the opposite ends of what we find pleasurable and disgusting in life. And they are the same thing.
Yeah. <laughs> Literally, <laughs> you know. Yep. And so I've always been fascinated, not with the shit part, but been fascinated with food and and how we <laughs> use it. It's hard to find good Mexican food in Japan. Um, and I'm from California, and so Mexican is, you know, the number one food for California people. Oh, yeah. Um, so I cook a lot of Mexican. I found a, a guy from Mexico nearby who, who makes tortillas, and so I get some really good fresh tortillas from him. And and so what, whatever I'm craving, it, it just, it, it's really good, you know? And um, yeah, just so, just so many things. And I, I try to make a lot of my own original recipes as well. So I, I don't even know what a lot of them are called. Going back to movies real quick, uh, what would you say is like your favorite movie of all time? Oh man, hard to say, but I've been asked that so many times over the years. And uh, I would have to say probably One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. When I entered university, I was a psych major. So I've always been interested in psychology, <laughs> psychiatry, mental health, mental you know, sickness, illness, and things like that. Just how the brain works. I mean, everything we do, everything we've ever known in our life, everything we've ever made or anything, it just is from the brain. You know, it has to go through the brain. And even the brain, we use the brain to dissect the brain. <laughs> you know, it's <laughs> pretty bizarre. Yeah, I mean, and the, so, the brain even named itself. <laughs> yeah, the brain named itself. And uh, so I always thought that's interesting. And for, for people, you know, mental health is, is a huge thing. And uh, when, you know, Jack Nicholson makes a movie about inside a mental institution. Oh, fuck. You know, I also really love... Uh, two other movies I have to say that people ask me about is um, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. That's great. That's great. Just the casting, the directing, everything. I love that film. And and they're, they're, these are films from my childhood. That, so they really meant a lot when I was about 10 years old, you know. I think 10 years old is the perfect age to really get into film. Oh, yeah. And, uh, <clears throat> and then uh, one of my, probably one of my top favorites, if not my favorite, uh, is Jeremiah Johnson which not a lot of people know, with Robert Redford. And, um, and it's a very simple movie. He plays a mountain man right after the uh, Civil War. And he didn't like war, and he didn't like people. And he, he just wanted to kind of escape society. And so he went up into the mountains and became a mountain man, and actually became kind of a legend. And I really liked that idea. It was such a beautiful, well-made movie with a great story. But um, also, I kind of felt like that when I came to Japan. That, you know, I came here with nothing, 300 bucks in my pocket. I had no friends, no job, no hotel reservation, nothing. And I just kind of figured things out. And that's kind of his story as well. Except he's fighting, you know, bears and Indians and things. I didn't have to do that. You did technically fight a bear. <laughs> I did. I fight bear. Yeah. You again? Oh, all right. I'm the toughest in the universe. <laughs> but I like fighting the bear part. That was great. Yeah. <coughs> Who else fights bear? You know, I watch it. I watch it all the time. Every January second, I watch it because um, January first, my girlfriend, my fiance, Tomoyo. She'll, she comes over for New Year's and everything, and we always really have a great time, eat and drink a lot, crab and wine and everything. And, uh, and then she goes home on January 1st. And January 2nd, I'm just kind of like by myself, eating leftovers, hungover. And my tradition is I watch Jeremiah Johnson, which takes place mostly in the snow. And that's, it was filmed in Robert Redford's on his land in Utah. So January 2nd is really cold in Tokyo. So what I do is I open up all my windows, I turn off the heater, I <clears throat> put a blanket around me, and but still cold, uh, and I watch <laughs> Jeremiah Johnson where he's just freezing in the cold throughout the whole movie. Wow. And I get a bottle of whiskey, and I get some good barbecue ribs or something, something really you kind of eat like you're, you know in the, in the mountains. <laughs> and I watch that movie every year. On That's January awesome. 2nd. So I, I do have certain traditions uh, with film that are really important to me.
uh, a lot of your voice credits are uh, present in a lot of classics and heavy hitters, if you will. Like, yeah, Virtual Fighter, Tekken, Shenmue, F-Zero, Battle of Chaos, Dead or Alive, Yakuza. Like, these are all video games that people have deep connections with. Mm. And like, 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 like these are video games that they either played growing up or they're just, you know, having a hard time in high school. And these video games were like uh, a, a sort of way to escape from reality. So um, I suppose the next question is, how does it feel being part of like a lot of these people's like memories and childhoods? and helping them grow to become the people they are today. Yeah, it's it's really amazing. Like I said, I wasn't really a player that much, but and to me, you know, doing the voice was just work. You know, it's fun work. But, you know, it's how you make your money, how you pay your bills. Um <clears throat> then later, when I started meeting people who were fans of the games, and they would tell me how much it meant to them. I, I, I didn't really know that until they told me. And it really made me feel close to them. That I could, you know, just the sound of my voice or whatever I put into the character. <coughs> that made them, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> it made them <coughs> like that character or trust that character in some way. And I thought, wow, <coughs> thank you. For really listening and appreciating something that I tried to do but with voice acting you don't know I mean it's not like stage acting you know where you see an immediate response you know you don't see the people right. playing it or listening to it you don't know so when you get that feedback it really does mean a lot and uh, met so many cool people like I said I did the uh, the Sonic Sega fan jam in Atlanta with uh, Patrick, put that together. Thank you, Patrick. Um, it was amazing. People would come. To, I'd sign something for them, and they'd talk, and we'd take a picture or something. And uh, they were like, you know, growing up, I really, I, I really liked, you know, Ren. He just had something about the guy, and you know, and we'd talk about the character and and what it meant to me, what it meant to them, and we would share a lot of the same feelings. Um, also, people with, especially with Shane Moo, uh, huge, wow, huge fan base. Oh, yeah. Some dependable, rock solid fans <clears throat> that actually brought that after d being dead for 15 years through their Kickstarter, which they broke Kickstarter on their first day. It was in like Time uh, Magazine, video game breaks Kickstarter kind of thing. <clears throat> and, um, the fans forced that game to be made. And uh, <clears throat> they come to Japan because uh, the first Shenmue 1 takes place in Japan around Yokosuka Air Force Base and uh, things like that. Um, and so there are actual shots, there's streets that you can walk down that are in the game. There are shops you can go in that are shops the character goes into in the game. <clears throat> so people make the sojourn to Japan to go to these actual to buy a drink in this one vending machine yeah. <laughs> and drink it the same way that Rio drinks it you know <laughs> and um, it's just amazing and just the love and the dedication and the heart that they have um, it, I just man I just thought I wish I had that you know <laughs> but to, to meet them and know that I was a part of what made them love the games um, makes me feel like I'm, you know, I'm kind of doing something worthwhile. I'm doing something that's important to people, and that feels really good. That's that, that's amazing. <laughs> yeah, because otherwise we don't really know how if people like it or how they feel, you know. But the game fans, you know, I always said that I really, I think ot otaku kind of people are kind of lucky because oh, yeah. they got something you know people might say oh you're otaku you're crazy or weird or you know <laughs> something but i disagree i think they're usually really smart and really nice and they have passion and they 
have, they're so lucky because when they go to bed at night, they have something they can think about, you know, oh, yeah. that they're, they're into. And when they wake up in the morning, they have something that they want to do today, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and, I, and I think a lot of people don't have that. And so I think otaku are very lucky to have that kind of passion in their life. And also there's com a community like you, like look at what you're doing with your show. You know, there's people that rally together and celebrate the passion. And I think that's so cool. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, thank you. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> We're doing it. Yeah. Don't quit your day job. Um, you got to work into it slowly. It's freelance. Um, but it doesn't mean you can't do it. So, uh, you know, practice, listen to, uh, listen to things, try to, like I said, in the bathtub, just try to make a bunch of voices, try to work out, but you have a, you have to have a good standard narration voice first. Then you go out from there on the different other voices, but make sure you have a good standard voice. Take some classes like you did. Um, that will help your, for your breath control and how you know, not to make paper noises and things. Um, you know, learn how to read ahead in a sentence. <clears throat> what you're reading is not coming out of your mouth now. What you're reading right now with your eyes, <clears throat> um, you know, what you're saying, that's, it's got to be a half a sentence apart kind of thing. Right. Um, <clears throat> so you got to train to do that. Um, but try, you know, it's a fun job. God, it's fun. Um, but unfortunately, so many people are doing it now because it is fun and it does pay, you know, good wages if you're working, yeah. um, that people want to do it. And people can do home studios now and things like that. I have a home studio. Uh, but it's don't just think you're going to start doing it full time. But try, you know, try. Uh, listen to other voice actors' demo tapes. You know, their demo reel online. See what they're doing. Try to copy what they're doing, what sounds good. Try to do it the same way. Um, if you want to come to Japan and do it, I would say probably don't. Um, you can do, you can try and do it part time, but uh, you're really not going to make enough money to live on because it's the market here is flooded, and there's already so many good people doing it that uh, if you come in as a fresh face for the new time without connections or experience, you might not get much work, if any. Right. So, I would say that's not a. a you have to be more realistic about that dream. But come to Japan and be an English teacher. Come to Japan and do something else. Um, and then do that on the side and see if you can. Try. But you have to be realistic about expectations. Nothing that I'm currently working on um, exactly. A lot of times I don't know about voice jobs I'll get until just before I get them, especially big ones like video games and things because they're top secret. Right. So they say, are you going to be free? You're going to have some free time next month. You're going to be in town. And I'll say, yeah, I'll be here. They say, okay, well, we're, we're going to contact you kind of thing. And so we don't really know far ahead of time. Um, I'm finishing up my a second book that I wrote. Uh, the first one was called Ericisms, uh, thoughts on life that spill out of my mouth from time to time. And it's just, uh, you know, kind of stupid, maybe insightful, maybe humorous uh, observations on life. Just like, you know, two or three lines of, of something <laughs> that. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, where, where, where can people purchase this, uh, this book? Amazon. Awesome. Good to know. Thank Amazon. you. It's called Ericisms. E-R-I-C-I-S-M-S. And it, a friend of mine said, oh, that's another Ericism. Like sometimes, especially when we're out drinking or something, I'll say something that I think is kind of profound, but in, in kind of a funny way, maybe. Yeah. Um, or observation on life. And they go, oh, that's another Ericism. And say, you should write those down. So I started writing them down. And I had like a, 200 of them in a uh, drawer. I was cleaning out a drawer and I have all these little pieces of paper. And... <coughs> so I picked out 100 that I thought were good had them translated into Japanese. <clears throat> and so 
people in Japan can understand them as well. <laughs> and then some of the harder hitting ones uh, about religion and things. I'm, I'm not a fan of religion. And, uh, but my mom is. <laughs> and so she said, well, I don't like this one. It's kind of not really nice about religion. And you know, I, have my, I want to buy it to give to my friends and they might not like it. So I, said, okay. so I cut some of the harder hitting ones. <laughs> and so I have another like hundred that I'm going to put into another book, a second version. And it's called, the first one was called Ericism's Thoughts on Life That Spill Out of My Mouth From Time to Time. And the second one is going to be called Ericism's Spilling Harder. Mm, all right. And so, um, and they all, they, the first one had like cool pictures of California, places I grew up. And, um, and the second one's going to have just more interesting photos of anything that just kind of match the, the, uh, the uh, Ericism a little better something it's fun it's a good toilet read you know it's nothing heavy or deep it's sometimes insightful i hope uh sometimes humorous i think um, all right you know some of them are funny like you know uh what a, a, laughter is your heart farting <laughs> the joy is in you and it has to come out yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but I always thought as a kid, laugh, uh, laughing is like heart, a heart fart. You know, I think. you know, things like that. Just little bits of pieces. So, um, yeah, check it out. It's it's like awesome. it's like seven bucks or something. So, okay, good to know. <laughs> yeah. Other other than that, I don't know the uh, voice jobs I got coming up because I don't really know ahead of time. Eric, thank you so much uh, for. Uh, taking time out of your busy schedule um, to uh, come on for uh, an interview. Uh, it's been a great pleasure uh, getting to just, just kind of sit and talk about uh, voice acting, um, you know, broadcast, uh, uh, narration, potatoes as Orton the Whale. <laughs> <laughs> that is going to do it for this edition of Token Titan Cast. Uh, hope everyone enjoyed. Um, now, Eric, where can people find you on social media? <clears throat> um, my website of my career, my de voice demos, videos, things like that. You can just find erickelso.com. Um, and it has all my contact information and things as well, my IMDB and Wikipedia, things like that. Um, on Twitter, I'm Eric Kelso Voice. So at Eric Kelso Voice is my Twitter handle. Um, and then Facebook, just Eric Kelso. I don't really do Facebook much, never have. But uh, yeah, those are pretty much my, my things. Once again, I am Davis Madol, also known as Titan Goji, also on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. And uh, if you like what you see, feel free to like, share, comment, subscribe, all that good stuff. Thank you all so much for tuning in, and uh, take it easy, y'all. Thank you. Thanks, Davis. Have a good time. Of course. Anytime. <laughs>